Welcome to our podcast. I'm Jess. I'm Mandy. And we are Drama Bonded. And today, we are coming at you with so much stuff. Man. Okay. so Lots of content. We finally are starting season 11 of Vanderpump Rules. Which we have been waiting for. Yeah. Much anticipation. Absolutely. And then we're going to cover episodes four and five of Rachel Goes Rogue. Yes. And then we want to talk about... The Tom and Tom interview on the Vile Files. Yes. And then, for our Bachelor people, we're going to cover episode two of Joey's season. Which has been excellent. It was so good. So good, right? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Uh, Living large right now. So if you used to watch The Bachelor and you fell off the wagon, or if you are interested at all in just watching it with us... So far, we have a lot of good energy around this season, and we would recommend joining. Yeah, everybody's bringing it, and we'll we'll get into why later. But uh, should we start with our candy review? Yes. This week, we are reviewing a Valentine's candy, and I hope you listen to this episode before it goes off the shelves. But it is Jolly Ranchers Jelly Hearts, and it took me eating, I don't know, more pieces than it should have to realize it's just a heart-shaped jelly bean. But... The flavors are cherry, raspberry, no, cherry, watermelon, and strawberry. Yeah, and I actually don't love jelly beans. Me neither. They didn't read jelly bean to me either, and yeah, until you're saying this, but they are so good, and I feel like they taste like Jolly Ranchers, Yes, which is kind of the best of both worlds, because I don't really love hard candy, so it gives me that punch-in-the-mouth Jolly Rancher flavor while being very nicely chewy. Yeah, and they're cute little hearts. So, so cute, yeah. I rate them a 10 out of 10. Go get some Jolly Rancher Jelly Hearts. Yeah. I I also love seasonal candy because it's like, poof, it's going to go away. (laughs) I need to. That's a good reminder. I'm going to go get my chewy Jolly Ranchers tonight. All right. Should we get into episode one? Yes, let's do it. Wow. Um, I feel like my first impression of this episode, very different vibes. Mm-hmm. Don't you just feel like the energy has kind of shifted a little bit? Dare we say maybe a little more mature? Yeah, I don't know. Everything just started off feeling a little heavy. For sure. Um, I I guess first point of order for me is, my God, those rooms were messy in <laughs> Tom and Ariana's house. And like, I just, woo hoo hoo You know, not being on reality television, I would be mortified if anyone saw my room looking like that. But I think that these people are so used to just, like, putting it all out there that they give zero fucks about what their living space looks like. Yeah, messy rooms probably the lowest of lows of their problems. Yeah, it's like, um, I think you know the ins and outs of my infidelity and my <laughs> and my relationship. So what's a messy room at this point? It's true. It's true. But it was wild. Um, I think James is so real for having that house and then... <laughs> The airplanes flying over. As somebody who lives near a strip mall, I relate. And it wasn't just one airplane that was loud. It was the entire scene, like inside the house, outside the house, constant airplanes. Oh, well, that, yeah, because he literally lives by the airport. That will be, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know if I could handle that. That would be, we're kind of also near a helicopter, I don't know, zone. It drives me batty and it's probably like a few times a week. I can't imagine all day, every day. Yeah, me but the neither. home looks nice. I'm I'm glad for him. I hope that that helps with. Yeah, I think this is the first time, and I don't know if it's the house. I don't know if it's the glasses. I don't know if it's the sobriety, um, the sobriety part three or four, whichever part we're on at this point. But I feel like James showed up very adult in episode one, which I was like, wow, I didn't know you were capable of feeling like an adult. Yeah, he says he's not doing drugs. Well, he's he's smoking California weed, sober. but like. Probably not doing cocaine, not drinking while DJing, which is good for him. So good for James. Let's see this behavior continue. That would be a really, that would be like being a bartender and being sober. That would be a very hard career to do with sobriety. I agree. So, I I mean, he's obviously struggled with sticking with the sobriety. I hope for his sake and his relationships, it sticks. Yeah, same, 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 same. Uh... 
what stuck out to you opening up? How how did it feel heavier to you? I don't know. I think being in the space with Ariana and Katie, um, everything also felt a little produced with like getting the people together. I think this is something that Jess and I were talking about, but earlier on in the show, and P.S., I know if you've been listening, you know that I'm rewatching right now, but earlier on in the show, all of these people were much more integrated in each other's lives in a very natural way, and they were also working at Sir as employees. And so, there, like, while I'm sure a lot of things were produced, like conversations with Lisa Vanderpumps or girls' nights or hangouts or whatever, it still was believable that these people were actually spending time, a lot of time with each other outside of recording. And so it didn't feel as set up. Whereas now I think a lot of the cast has grown up and they aren't close and there, there's a lot of divisive stuff happening right now. And they actually don't probably maintain relationships with each other outside of the show, aside from probably like Tom and Tom and Katie and Ariana. Yeah. I just don't really know how close the cast is anymore. And so anytime the cast is being brought together, at least in episode one, it feels a little forced and produced. And like this is only happening because the show is being recorded. And don't get me wrong. I'm still going to watch. I'm still going to enjoy it. But I think the show is losing a little bit of its magic because of that. Yeah, I can see that. And I think that that is evident. More so, and we'll get into those episodes, Rachel talks about the production angle of things even more. And I think that that is, it's hard, like now that the curtain's been pulled, it's like, oh, I can't not see that. And I think you're spot on with that. So I will say watching Katie and Ariana walk into Tom Tom again, like after seeing them walk in the first time when it was first open yeah, together the and flashback. then the, the flashback, I... I don't know. I'm a sucker for a good flashback. And I feel like this episode did kind of a good job with that, where I was like, "Ooh, OK, like they're making me feel some things. And I think it was effective and it also made sense for this episode. That part, while obviously produced, didn't feel overly forced. I think just seeing how happy they were in some of those flashbacks and like in my rewatch, they are in a healthy spot in their relationship right now. And I think it does make all of this heaviness and all of this um, complicated drama with the breakup and the infidelity harder to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I felt when, so I obviously am a bandwagoner and that I jumped on Vanderpump Rules. I remember very vividly you coming over and telling me about Scandaval and being like, holy shit. And I was like, okay, on it. So I was rewatching all this, trying to catch up so that I could watch the end of season 10 with you and it was really devastating to see how much like Ariana, regardless, just like no feelings on either of these people aside, Ariana went so hard for Tom all the time, so hard. And it really sucks to watch her do that season after season, knowing what's coming. She was constantly protecting him. She was defending him. She was making him look better. Yeah. Tom without Ariana is dumb. <laughs> That's and she true. speaks Tom so fluently, I think, maybe even to like almost too much. Like, I think she's giving him too much credit. But when she would jump in and say, no, that's not what Tom's trying to say. He's saying this. It was like, oh, damn it, Ariana. I OK, I see that. But also like and I don't even know how if I was that aware of that until they broke up. And I was like, whoa, the energy is so different now. Right. That Tom is completely incapable of saying anything without sounding like a complete <laughs> asshole. And the only person that's coming to his aid is Schwartz. And that's not necessarily a good look either. Yeah, that's not the backup you need. <laughs> um. OK, so back to the episode. So they go into Tom Tom and they're there because James is DJing. And yeah. so we have Katie, Ariana, Lala, Sheena and Lisa, Lisa Vanderpump. Yeah, and Lala pulls Lisa, I think, to have a conversation about how she's feeling about Rachel and how she was not, I guess, moved by the the last five minutes of the season finale where Rachel said that if she ruins her relationship with Tom, she has nobody. And Lala, I think, in a moment of, like, real awareness was able to recognize, like, she could have just as easily been Rachel being raked over the coals and having nobody 
given all the things that she did. And she finally was willing to be like homewrecker, mistress, all of those things. She's like, if you really just lay them out, they are true. But, you know, she's like, I, I don't know. I, I appreciated her awareness around that, that she's she's always done a good job of maintaining her own like identity through this and not letting a mistress or a homewrecker or any of these things really define her. But for her to still be able to be aware of those things, I think, is big of her. Yeah, I'm um, a lot of accountability and self-awareness in that moment. Yeah. And I mean, she fucking hates Rachel. Yeah. So for her to also be able to have a moment of like real empathy, it's like, oh, Lala's grown up too. Lala is really starting to understand like life isn't so black and white and things are really complicated and everybody's not just directly a good guy or a bad guy. Yeah. And I think it's hard just because, you know, at the reunion, we saw Lala go full force, like uh, a attack dog um, <laughs> on Rachel where she was just ready to rip her to shreds. And I think that's two part. I think that Lala is a performer and that she wants to just give it all she has. And then second part, I think that Lala was still processing her breakup and divorce from Randall, or I don't know if they, I don't think they were married, sorry, but her separation from Randall, who's the father of her child, um, who was count caught in a lot of horrific, uh, couch casting, <laughs> couch and casting and all of that smut. So I think Lala came into the reunion with like a lot of anger and she was just ready to go. And I think she was projecting a lot of her anger and sadness onto Rachel as yes. well. Um, because as much as she cares for Ari Ariana, I do believe that a lot of that was coming from her own experience and her own hurt. But I also think it was nice and refreshing to see her. She's been doing the work like you see that conversation with her mom. You see where she's at in her healing process. You see and she's in more of a like sad. I need to build rebuild my life place. And I think in that space, she's willing to have more empathy for herself and for other people. Yeah, I I loved that conversation. You know, it flashed back between her talking to her mom and then that amazing outfit that she was wearing in the ITM. Um, I loved that she said, you don't heal without feeling the things. And I think that's so true. And it's really easy to skip that step because you're like, well, I shouldn't. I need to just be okay. So you like pretend that you're okay and you push everything down and you're like, well, if I'm depressed, I'm going to get out of this house and I'm going to go do something. And sometimes the right response is to just be depressed and lay in bed and be sad and to really feel what you're feeling because that allows you to process everything that has happened to you. That lets you like, you're kind of going through the cycle of like getting it all out. And unless you do that, you don't heal. So I loved hearing that from Lala. I think that that really, that shows to me that she is doing the work and she does recognize like what needs to happen in order to move forward. Yeah. And I think an important side note for us to reference is Rachel didn't know that that voice memo that was sent to her was sent during filming until she watched the episode. So on the one hand, this was easily a storyline for Lala. And this is when they were filming this episode, they did not know that Rachel was not coming back. And I think that's important to note just because as much as I recognize and, and like see all of that for Lala, I do want to say that it was a produced moment. However, I also don't think Lala is just the type of person to like do it for the sake of recording if she didn't actually like feel the way she felt. Do you know what I mean? I think so. Yeah, I would agree with like, that. Like I don't think she would just send a note, a nice um like apologetic note to Rachel unless she actually felt those things regardless of what production wanted her to do. Yeah, Lala's not somebody to kowtow or bend over and, you know, whatever for production. I'm pretty sure she's got strong feelings on that. Yeah, so it was a produced moment, but I do think that Lala was coming from a genuine place, I guess. Yeah, I really I felt like that from Lala too. That really that's how that felt to me. Um, and, you know, one of the things, too, like sort of recognizing how produced all of this is, I think it does make me pause and think, well, it's really actually kind of hard to tell anybody's intentions right now. And so I'm going to be a lot more careful going forward projecting that because clearly, even if they were to do something off camera, very likely production would want them to turn around, do it again and do it on camera. And so it makes it really hard to, like, determine 
like what's for the camera and what's, what's not, not for the camera. Yeah, that's really tricky. And I think you're right. I get that vibe from Lala too. I really feel like she meant it and that she wasn't necessarily just doing it for the show. However, too, like, yeah, it's just always good to keep in mind. Like, that is very real. <laughs> On top of that, I, I guess this, this is connected. So I want to kind of loop back to the girls night. So Ariana admits that it's the first time she's been in Tom Tom since the phone fell out of the pocket during that is when she found out about the affair, the infamous phone. <laughs> and that's a lot. You know, she's in that setting. If anyone has listened to this podcast, has gone through a heinous breakup or dealt with infidelity or had their heart broken, you remember where you were when that happened. You know, yeah, what I mean? you do. You remember the smells. You remember the setting. You remember the song. We just have those moments kind of imprinted in our body. And so I I do think that's like a big deal for her to be like, this is the first time I've been here. I'm feeling all the feels. That's a lot, you know, and she's connecting with her women friends. She's getting support from Lisa. She has Schwartz awkwardly trying to say hi to her, which is obnoxious. Oh my <laughs> but God. her and Lala have this moment where they're able to kind of have this reconciliation and support each other and hug it out. And then Lala, like, brings up the fact that she had to send Raquel. Sorry, I'm going to just in when we're talking about it in the show, it's hard for me because they're still calling her Raquel. But um, Lala mentions that she sends Rachel a voice memo to talk about how she can understand Rachel's position in all of this and how she like feels for her. And she's here if Rachel needs someone to talk to about it. And I think that like catches Ariana off guard and Ariana doesn't know how she feels about it. And I really do think that as much as I like Lala's empathy, I thought it was the wrong time for her to kind of like loop Ariana in on that moment. It's like you're in Tom Tom. She's already going through a lot. You guys just had this moment where you were bonding again. And then <laughs> I think those were two separate things. Remember, because she was in that blue dress the jean dress and then the next time they met they met up the next day somewhere else and she was wearing the alien cardigan with the camisole I thought camisole. it was at the end of the night at Tom Tom they just changed Oh I thought it was a, I thought it was like they were hugging at Tom Tom and then she said I just sent Rachel a message Oh I thought okay neither here nor there well yeah Lala's timing on that was terrible terrible um but also, I don't know, like, when a good time to do that is. There's maybe never a good time, but there, I think there's a range. Right. Maybe <laughs> not, like, literally a second later. Um, but, you know, to Ariana's credit, I think she heard that. And I think she understood what Lala was getting at. And I think that Ariana, being one of the more normie people on this show, had a lot of emotional intelligence to be like, this is about Lala and not about me. And I can understand where she's coming from. And it's not my place to tell her who she can and can't talk to. And I love Ariana for that. Like, for all the things that I think she does wrong, she is really very consistent in that. And I feel like she's been a good friend to all of the women as much as she can be. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the first time she cut anyone out of her life in the show was when she found out about the affair and she's like, if you're friends with Tom, you're not my friend. I'm pretty sure that's one of the first like hard boundaries she's made in the show. Yeah. And honestly, that's so valid. You can't heal if you've got somebody still orbiting you or somebody that, you know, orbiting that person. Like it's just too much. You don't, there, there, that's no longer a person you can trust. And it's not about them. It's about the person who obviously it was about Tom, but like I a thousand percent respect that boundary and understand it. But the whole history of the show and the women's friendships are like women cutting out other women. <laughs> it's like, yeah. we're not friends. Don't associate with them. If you are their friend, then you're not loyal to me. Like, that is the whole song and dance of the girl group in this show. Which is such a bummer. And in this one instance, though, I do get it because fuck Tom. No, for sure. But I'm saying Ariana has always been kind of like, I just want to be friends with most of you. you. Yeah, she really <laughs> is so good at like towing that line of like, that's your guys' bullshit, not mine. So we're good. And that's that. <laughs> and I do think the, then for Ariana to make that boundary is like, that should be respected. Yeah. Sheena. 
Uh, yeah, let's talk about the Sheena of it all for a second. Because during that um, girls' night at Tom Tom, I think Ariana was talking about she was talking about the affair in some aspect, and then Sheena pipes in is like, "Yeah, but what about how much it hurt me and how much it affected my life?" And I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, cue the most major eye roll of all time. Like, why? Like, why is this the time and place for Sheena to make it about her? It's always about Sheena. But it was like she was competing with Ariana's experience with her own experience. And it's like, sit down. What the fuck? Yeah, I have zero interest in Sheena. Sheena could go away on the show and it would be <laughs> totally fine by me. So, yeah, I'm not. We don't want to hear from you. We're listening to Ariana. Thank you. I just felt like she felt so entitled in that moment to having it about her and her experience. And I. I was like, wow, you are so oblivious right now. Like, you can't see past the end of your nose to just, like, give your friend space and let her have her moment. Yeah, the way that I had that explained once to me is, like, you've got the center of the bullseye, and there's the person that had the thing directly happen to them. And then you've got to ring out, and they're the people who experience that, like, Like close, but it's a rippling out. And, like, Ariana, and you never talk to the person I mean, not never. That's too hard of a thing. But like, by and large, your experience does not overshadow the person's experience in the ring in the bullseye in the bullseye. So you have to be careful. It's not that Sheena can't talk about these things or feel really betrayed by the whole situation. She can. But it's like, don't fucking talk to Ariana about it and don't interrupt her feeling her feelings for you to express yours. Go have that time with Katie. Go have that time with whoever else is still on this show. Yeah, this is not for Ariana to deal with. And I just, ugh, Sheena. Amen. Yeah, so that was that was annoying for sure. Also, her texting Tom Sandoval is, I think you can add a little bit to that. You watched the after show. I didn't. But her texting Tom about losing his friend on the surface seems like a nice thing but man sheena is just always doing things that are best for sheena and not really anybody else and this is an example of that so i guess um if you watch episode one and you haven't watched the after show on peacock there's an after show where they're kind of just interviewing the cast and i'm sure they'll they'll do it each episode but in this one sheena was talking about how tom sandoval lost one of his childhood friends ali who i guess um, was also friends with the group and would go with them in music festivals. And I don't know, the, the group on the show was also friends with Ali. And Ali passed away. Sounds very tragic. And Sheena sends Tom a text saying like, hey, um, I know we haven't been there for you, but like, I know how much like this hurts you. And I just want you to know that we're here to support you. Please let us know if you need anything. And then you get Tom Sandoval and he's like, yeah, Sheena sent me that text, but she also sent it like the same day when she's throwing my name in the mud on her podcast. He's like, you have to understand that on social media and her podcast, Sheena was like, would not get my name out of her mouth and was like blowing up my life. And in the same day, she sends me a text saying how she wants to support me because my friend passed away. Like, fuck you, Sheena. (laughs) Like, you're not my friend. And then in response to Sheena's text, Tom Sandoval blocked her in any of her associated accounts, which also blocked her daughter, which is, I don't know, I just think that's hilarious. Well, yeah, because, like, it's not like it's Summer Moon on there adding her photos. (laughs) It's Sheena. So, yeah, Summer Moon is blocked because Sheena is blocked. But, I mean, listen, I'm not Team Sandoval, but in this moment, I totally understand where he's coming from, where it's, like, an obvious moment where Sheena is only sending this text to make Sheena look good in the moment and make Sheena look like she's doing the right thing. It wasn't actually about maybe wanting to support Tom because if she did want to support Tom, she probably wouldn't continue to be utilizing his name to blow up her social media and podcast presence. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just the Sheena show. (laughs) Also, I was so unaware that Sheena had a cat until now. Oh, yeah. Sheena's been consistently a cat lady on the show. That's like one of the things that I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. (laughs) The things you miss. Uh, I also just want to touch back on Schwartz struggling to have a relationship with Ariana. Like, oh, yeah. What was the text she sent him? Oh, that was epic. I hope you suck on Tom's dirty dick. (laughs) Fuck you. Yeah. And then, go suck on Tom's dirty dick. 
she doesn't even remember what she sent him. She's like, I don't think it was that bad. And then in the ITM, he's like reading the text, like, go suck on Tom's dirty dick and fuck you. And he's like, Jesus. <laughs> so great. So funny. And I'm glad that Tom kind of laughed about it, too. I thought that was a good moment. But I think it's also worth noting, like, even though Schwartz is Sandoval's friend, He's also Ariana's, Ariana's friend. friend. And so that, I think, is another level of betrayal for her, too, to realize, like, that those two were in cahoots. Of course. That is just an extra layer of that. And Schwartz really hasn't done anything to show any, I don't know, like, remorse. He's not sorry enough. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that to me, and then him kind of moping and being like, it's really making inroads with the other girls hard. And it's like, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> Um, whose fault is that? That's not on Ariana. That's on you, buddy. Yeah. So oh, Schwartz. <sighs> Schwartz and his little Schwartzy world with his Schwartzy plants and his Schwartzy beetles. Yeah, he's <laughs> I don't know what something. Um for as much like it didn't actually a lot didn't happen in the episode, really. Is there anything yeah, else you I wanted think the to like? The episode is more just like, here is the cast. Here's where everybody's at. Yeah, and kind of like who's willing to hang out with who. Uh, and then at the very end of the episode, we see Tom Sandoval come home. Yeah, from Special Forces. So that'll be. I'm I'm excited for next week. You know, see yeah. see what Tom's gonna bring to the show at this point. Okay, well, episode one done. Yeah. Uh, do you want to transition into episodes four and five of Rachel Goes Rogue? Yeah, you a guys podcast were... about a podcast about reality TV. We're still listening. I will say. I'm more invested in the podcast right now because she's really spilling the tea with the ba- what happens on the backside of the show with production and how that influenced like what she was doing in season 10. And also, like I had mentioned that part about how now we know that she was still maybe going to be on that show as far as like season. I mean, episode one is concerned. They were still like, oh, we need to like play Raquel into the show and so that's interesting, too, you know, because now we know she's not going back, tra la la. But having that inside look of like, oh, they still are trying to get her back on the show at this point is interesting. Yeah. Um, I I have been shocked. I, I think she's really done an about face for me on how she's presenting stuff. And I like that they're pulling questions from Instagram and that they're kind of like she's getting grilled to an extent. Like she they, she really is answering harder questions. Yeah. And I I really respect that. It does nothing for me in terms of how much I dislike Sheena. Actually, it does. It makes me dislike her even more. She's ridiculous. Uh, but the perspective that Rachel's taking on all of this is really telling. Um, I think the the punch and the uh the restraining order, how that all went down was really interesting and you know she recognized that the reason Sheena was probably so upset about that was because Brock had been in a domestic violence dispute and for her to be tied up in one too could be really detrimental to their ability to parent for Brock's ability to see his kids that still live in Australia like the the fallout of that was really potentially very big for Sheena. And you know, it's interesting. The domestic um, dispute was a part of the show and I kind of forgot about it until she referenced it on the podcast. Yeah. And that makes everything make a lot more sense. Yeah. But also you understand then why Sheena would go and lie and would try and like angle it to where she's the victim. Uh, Hate that. Also lying about Rachel living rent free in her apartment. (laughs) Um, God damn it, Sheena. Uh, so that to me did not like, um, I do appreciate that Rachel seems to have a lot of awareness on her lack of empathy for Katie in season 10 going through a divorce and how shitty and sort of just flippant she, Rachel was towards Katie without really understanding the position that Katie was in. Yeah. I think that was really refreshing for her to look back on that and understand that the hurt she was causing an already hurt person. Um, So that, that was always one of the things that bothered me the most in season 10 was kind of how the Schwartz and Rachelness of it all panned out and how Katie was impacted in that. Yeah. It was such a bad look for Rachel. It's like, whoa, girl, you're already fucking up. And now you're just going to be blatantly an asshole about all of this. It was sort of like, maybe this is more of who you are than 
what you've let on, but I think her being able to recognize and come back and be like, Ugh, yeah, that was bad of me. I, I shouldn't have done that. That was, that was lacking in empathy. It's like, okay, well, you know, we yeah, learn and grow. Because even if the kiss ended up being, um, pushed by production in the end, she still was a willing player in the storyline. Yeah. And this is after, you know, she tried to do the right thing at one point by telling Katie that she initiated, um, the question of like, hey, do you want to make out to Schwartz? Which I was kind of like impressed that Raquel had the balls to do that at the moment. I was like, okay, she's right. Katie's going to find out. It's better if she finds out from you. But then the fact that like she still goes on the girls trip, she has this opportunity to kind of rebuild these friendships with these women. And then all of that kind of deteriorates and she ends up kissing Schwartz in the end. I know it's complicated and I know there's like a lot of play there. And she does talk about the girls trip on episode five. But it's also hard to see how all that all plays out after, like, she had the opportunity to maybe not go that direction. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the girls' trip? Yeah, let's talk about it. That, to me, is really – I'm bothered by that because it does feel like Rachel was being bullied in those moments. And I understand that she didn't respond well to it. But then to hear that the next day when they left Las Vegas and go to Tahoe that she recognized she kind of needed to get out of Dodge, but production was like, no way, you can't leave. And sort of in the end, Rachel had to make the concessions of going to Guys Night when they got back to, man, where do they live in California? In L.A. In L.A. West Hollywood. West Hollywood. Thank you. And then also that she had to stir the pot with Lala by saying that Oliver only Oliver chose Rachel, not Lala. Yeah, there were some very forced production moments in for, that scene. Yeah, for her to be able to leave. And it just, I don't know, that was, that's, that's shitty. I see both sides. I, I don't, don't want to excuse bullying. Um, but I also think that you know Raquel came on this trip after admitting that she tried to kiss Schwartz and like all of that and then she has that drunken moment where she she tells La La like well you're lucky that you don't have a man for me to go after and she's really kind of like fueling this already existing fire where Katie's hurt from her divorce and Lala's hurt because she's leaving a really um toxic relationship and these women are like ready to bite and Raquel is kind of messily giving them opportunity to rise to the occasion so i think both experiences can be true um i do think that when girls team up against one other person like that's rough to watch but i also don't think that raquel was necessarily an innocent bystander in this situation yeah it just feels to me like maybe her back was up against the wall a little bit and you know to bite back in that moment maybe made sense And I'm not saying that it is good because, like, it's not. But also, it's just like, "Hmm, yep, I see how this happened. I've been in those moments where I'm not going to take shit, but also definitely didn't need to deal it. Um, So that that is really just uncomfortable for me. I don't love that. And I don't love that in order for Rachel to leave a situation that wasn't serving her production. Yeah. Was like, we're going to make it worse for you before we can make it better. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... That sucks. Ooh. So what were there anything in episodes four and five that stuck out to you that you want to touch on? I will just say, man, if you guys haven't been listening and you're watching the show, it might be worth listening because Yeah, give that girl some views uh, or some listens. I, I think it's worth it. I think it's been really informative. I think it's helped me kind of understand the 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 players at play here a little bit better. Um, I do think that she's answering hard questions. I do think that I have more, um, I understand where she's at in her healing journey more. And so I'm able to empathize with her story more. Um, I think she's right for not going back on the show. So I still think that there's a lot of work to be done, but I, I, I think that her perspective and what she's saying is is really interesting and I'm getting a lot of value at it, especially in relations to where we're at with the show. So if you want to, I don't know, 
Yeah. You need a new secret layer. I think it's a really interesting listen. I do too. And that I'm glad you said that. I think one of the points that she brings up is how she is a perpetrator. She did engage in the illicit affair. Like that was really not, obviously that was deplorable, bad behavior. And also it's worth noting, like she is the victim of assault. She is the victim of Tom recording her without her consent. You know, she really has also experienced a lot of things and like, the um the dog rescue betraying the confidence there where that was supposed to they weren't supposed to come forward about having Graham and they did that and so I think she talks about Tom weaponizing Ariana's mental health yeah and I think that Rachel is in a position where she is a victim and she also is a perpetrator and I appreciate that perspective because so often there's not nuance in conversations that we have people really want one thing to be true and everything else to be false and it's like unfortunately. There are a lot of things that can be true, and it takes some emotional intelligence to be able to separate those things and to be able to see both sides of that and not – people don't have to be a perfect victim to still be a victim, and I think it's good that she's having this dialogue, and I think that this is something that will – that is really beneficial to narratives generally when women are involved. Yeah, she talks about sending Tom the lightning bolt uh, uh, postcard. <laughs> Which then gets brought up, you know, that that happens. And I know, I think it's, we we weren't going to talk about episode six. Um, I haven't finished it yet. But I think she does have a lot of awareness of, like, being able to watch Ariana experience that and her be like, uh. Yeah, and she also goes into depth about her how deep her friendship was with Ariana, which is very interesting because they have very different perspectives on how close they were as friends. And I think that's another example of like both both truths can be true. Um, But I also think, you know, Rachel says that she wasn't really that close with Ariana and, you know, Ariana thinks that they were close. And so then. I don't know. That's also insightful in different ways. And I also think that says something about Rachel's ability to be able to connect with women, because I think, um, unfortunately, when you grow up doing pageants, you are inherently competing with women all the time. And it inhibits your ability to, ability to feel safe with women, want to be friends with women. Um, I do kind of wonder about that. I think about that sometimes in relation to like CrossFit athletes, like games athletes and how small that pool of really competitive women are and how to be friends with people that you are competing with. And if that is even possible, you know, and I know I'm taking this into sports a little bit, but Maddie Rogers um, is an Olympic weightlifter who also has talked about like how hard it is to have friends who have the same aspirations that you do. And you're literally both going after the same thing. Yeah. And that I think is a very valid experience and like that can be okay, but it is worth recognizing that that is a struggle and that also women are owed being friends with all women, but also like it is appearing that that's something that Rachel struggles with. On that note, both Ariana and Rachel were going after the same thing. Yeah, right. Well, Ariana already had the thing. I know, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. If Raquel did have feelings for Sandoval, that would maybe inhibit her um, ability to actually have a real friendship with Ariana. Right, and, sort of a, an arm's length away. And so I can see how the two of them would perceive that relationship very differently. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a really good point. Yeah. So Ariana, I think it's fair for Ariana to assume that they were friends, even if she, you know, maybe Rachel didn't feel the same. Yeah. And Rachel does explain, like, part of it is just the fact that they got thrown together because of COVID and just the restrictions related to that. And so she ended up filming with Ariana more than she had in the past. And that, it, so the friendship sort of was like, a friendship of convenience as far as Rachel was concerned and Ariana, I guess being somebody who's like, Oh no, I like you. We're filming together. Why are we not friends kind of thing? And so like that, well, that's how you get to like, both things can be true. And that's not, and that's not to excuse Rachel. It's just like, I think that people really felt like she was lying about that. And now you're like, ah, I get it. I see. It doesn't, it doesn't condone anything, but it does sort of help you conceptualize the production element of the show. But also throughout the show, Ariana does protect Raquel a fair amount. 
like she kind of goes to bat for the people in the group that are getting the most hate. She and does. So I even before they were friends, I think it's hard not to notice that Ariana like goes out of her way to try to keep the peace to make sure these people aren't eaten by the the mean girls. <laughs> Well, and also she's had moments with Tom where she's just like, I don't want to listen to you shit on the girls. Yeah. And yeah, I will I will give it to Ariana. And I do think Rachel calls that out. She's like, you know, she was somebody who never talked down to me and always went out of her way to make me feel welcome. And I I fucked that up. I betrayed that. And I won't take that for granted or, you know, yeah, she so I appreciate that she does recognize that Ariana did really have her back and regardless of Rachel's feelings toward Ariana, Ariana's feelings towards Rachel were genuine. And she really did not only say it, but like showed that with action. So Rachel's doing a good job of doing the work and being better at taking accountability. But on the other hand, we have Tom Sandoval on Nick Vial's podcast. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, is what? that okay if we transition to that? A uh, mess. Oh, yes, please. I think that weirdly is... Even though Rachel's dropping the tea, this is wild. So I have been a fan of the Vile Files for a really long time. Um, I think that Nick is a good interviewer and asks um, real questions to get um, more out of his guests than I would say other podcasts do. And my world kind of exploded when last year Nick started covering Scandaval because he hadn't really been in the Bravo verse yet. And so it was like my bachelor world and my Vanderpump rule world was crossing over and it was just fireworks. I was so excited <laughs> that he was in the loop and he cared about it. And I just think, um, Jess is not a big Nick Vial fan, but in my opinion, I just, I find his ability to, really question like emotional intelligence and actions and hold people accountable. I, I think he does a good job of that. And so he throughout all of Scandaval was like really bringing up some really excellent points and he really wanted to interview Tom Sandoval and none of us ever really thought that was going to happen. Well, they went on special forces together and I watched pieces of it, but it was great because I got to see Nick Vial and Tom Sandoval get in a fist fight and Nick, <laughs> Tom Sandoval also cried while pooping, which was hilarious. So, you know, <laughs> there was a couple of gems in there. I don't know if I really like the show, but I was just watching it for the tea. And because they made a relationship, Nick did Tom a favor, went on Tom Sandoval's podcast. And then now we had the Toms on Nick's podcast. And you guys. What a mess. It, he described it as unhinged, and I think that that is what it was. The episode was ridiculous. Yeah, well, we start with just, like, Schwartz was on time, and Sandoval was five minutes late. No, 45 minutes well, late. Well, I know, but oh. to start. Oh, to start. Five I minutes see. late. <laughs> And then, like, they're not getting a hold of him. It's like and time is just ticking. And they're recording. Yeah. It's and, on YouTube. Yeah. And Nick is just like, we have to get going. So, like, Schwartz slides over, puts on the headphones, and Nick just begins grilling Schwartz, which I love. Um, yeah. And Tom Sandoval, in, like, does not roll in he, he, until he 45 called, minutes. He hasn't texted. Like, nobody has any idea why he's not there. Well, and then Nick finally does get a hold of him. And Tom is, like, an idiot. He does not even seem to, like, he doesn't know what day it is. He doesn't know what time it is. He's laughing. Just and Nick's pissed. <laughs> I think Nick felt really disrespected in that moment, which is well, yeah, very valid. <laughs> Listen, people's time is valuable. Like, you can be late, but you fucking call and you let people know. You don't just like no call, no show and not know what time it is. And then to laugh when Nick is like, uh, yeah, it's 219. We're recording. Where are you? I don't even know if it really warrants getting too much into the Schwartz stuff. Um, Schwartz was very on brand. Yeah, he was. He was um, he. Tom Sandoval seemed like he was not sober. I don't know what he was doing, but he seemed 
just not okay. Well, Whereas Schwartz at least was able to maintain a conversation. <laughs> and seemed, yeah, like a relatively normal person. But yeah, Tom Sandoval comes in. He's wearing... Stained pants. Stained bell-bottom track pants. They kind of remind me of... um. What's what's that monkey? Um, the, Donkey Kong? No, no, no. It doesn't matter. Okay, I, it'll come to me. But um, it was really popular in the 90s. Those pants, like, anyway. He's wearing these red track suit bell-bottom pants that, like, have big stains on the knees. Yeah. He rolls in in a baseball cap and huge sunglasses and is, like, having a hard time understanding that he needs to like put on the headphones, pull the mic to him. This is a man who has a podcast. Tom is also podcasting. He's not unfamiliar with the nature of how to literally he's, he's podcast. He's recorded all the time. Yeah. And so for him, yes, that too. Like, oh my God. So for him to just like roll in is like still completely oblivious to what the fuck. I don't know. And then argues with Nick Oh my God. About Nick being late to his podcast rather than just being apologetic for being 45 minutes late to this podcast. And it's really hard to watch. Natalie is Nick's fiance and she's in this interview too. And Tom just is like not dropping how late Nick was. He's like, you didn't show up to like 8 30. Totally deflecting. Totally deflecting, refusing to take any accountability. And Natalie pulls up a text and she's like, I have a text for Nick, from Nick on this day at 6 52 that says, finished recording, headed to Whole Foods. And Tom is literally like, Nick didn't show up till 8 30 to record. And then Nick pulls out his phone and like goes through the messages that he sent to Tom about this. And Tom, and the reason I'm harping on this is because the the level of delusion that Tom has, and I think Nick really points something out, which is he's like, Tom, I believe you believe what you're saying. And that's the scary thing. And that's the scary thing. Like you have created this story in your head, despite all evidence to the contrary. You think that is a way to like, and I think that's how Tom operates. I was going to say, like, we've seen this Tom Sandoval on the show so many times, but I honestly just thought that he was a fucking liar. But that now you're questioning, like, does he just actually believe that all the lies he tells are truth? You know what I mean? Like, does he just believe his narrative? And like, that's that's what he actually believes is what happens. Yeah, I I can't even I feel like I pride myself on being able to be empathetic and understand or at least try really hard to understand where people are coming from and to maybe try to think how they're thinking. That's not really a possibility. But, you know, I make the effort. I I don't understand that. That to me is so like it's scary. Like, yeah, that's weird. That's weird. really bizarre behavior that is sort of just like are you okay? Or maybe is it a gradual thing that happens that after you lie so much, you gain this ability to just like have no remorse and accept for accept the truth as you want it want to see it. Yeah, that yeah, I mean, something, right? Like, I, I have no idea. Yeah, that could be it, too. Like, it's just, it's wild. I don't know people like this. I don't, <laughs> what? It it really, unhinged is a very good way of putting it. And he Nick, wasn't able to answer questions without getting really defensive, without crying, without yelling. Um, He had a hard time just saying full sentences and carrying on a, yeah. A thought. Well, it was answering a question. Nick wanted or oh, Tom made the statement. He's like, what does everybody want from me? It happened. There's nothing I can do now. And Nick was like, well, you could learn from it. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm learning from it. And it's like, great. What have you learned? And Tom, then he blabbers for a while and, and then says nothing. I, I don't know, know man. man. I don't know what I learned. And it's like, if you're coming on this podcast to be interviewed and I, whatever, like Nick is very consistent with the way that he interviews people. Nick does ask hard questions. Nick does try to get to the bottom of things. I really believe that Nick had every intention of setting Tom Sandoval up to win. I think that that is just sort of Nick's MO and I have no reason to believe that he would do this any differently with Sandoval. And like, 
he Tom just showed up so unprepared and unable to like, here's a fucking amazing platform for you to like be asked hard questions to actually answer things in a way that might sort of start helping your, you know, the way the public perceives you yeah. on a better track. And at the beginning of this season, fucking blows he it. He blew it. And like, there's no reason for him to have done that because Nick didn't even ask any questions. Like, they were hard, but it's not like they were questions out of left field. These were all things Tom should have come ready to talk about. And again, Schwartz is always like saving Tom. Like, at one point, Tom is talking about how Ariana just belittled him all the time and took away his self worth and he, he was nothing. And he's kind of using this narrative to describe why he had the affair. And Tom Schwartz is like, yeah, but you know, it sounds like you're blaming Ariana when you say it that way. Right. And you don't you're not blaming Ariana. Right. Like Schwartz was constantly trying to swoop in and be like, he doesn't actually mean this when he's saying, you know, Ariana made me feel like shit. And so what else was I supposed to do, man? I, I had was to a go, slave to my emotions, man. Yeah, I had to go bang the hot 20 year old that showed intent, like 26 year old that showed me attention. Yeah. And <laughs> so it was a real, it was hard to watch and it just, oh gosh, I guess this is like one of those things. Like, yeah. Um, Tom has, has not done any work. Well, not only has he not done any work, but like, Here's another weird ass instance of, I guess, two things can be true. <laughs> like, Tom really believes all of that. He does. And like, I don't know. Unless Ariana is like some master level manipulator, we have seen her defend and stick up for Tom and be his biggest supporter time after time after time on this show. And, you know, when he tried to play this whole, oh, she belittles me, man. Like, I asked her about these pants. And then they literally, this was at the end of season 10, they cut to the scene of him trying on his various sequined pants. And she's just answering his questions. Like, she's not being demeaning. She's not belittling him. She's engaged in the conversation. And Tom's like, oh, she just, she demeans me. And it's like, but she wasn't. Like, and yet Tom really does seem to believe that that was the case. And I, you're right. Maybe it's just these are lies he has to tell himself and has to believe because otherwise he's got no moral compass or values to guide him. Well, and, you know, maybe things happen that we don't see. But regardless of whatever the dynamic was in their relationship, break up with her. You know what I mean? Like nothing really excuses your behavior. Right. Don't go agree to give your sperm to eggs if you're really having that hard of a time in your relationship. Like yeah. if things are really that bad, don't do that. Don't say that you were protecting her by not breaking up with her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you want to watch a train wreck, go watch it on YouTube. Honestly, I found the whole thing hard to listen to in a watch, but I just think it's an interesting juxtaposition to what we're getting from Rachel versus Tom. Yeah, it was, yeah, wild. <laughs> and on that note, should we talk about The Bachelor? Oh, my gosh, yes. Okay, we're going to swoop out of the, the depths of hell with Tom Sandoval into the brightness of The Bachelor. <laughs> and Joey. <laughs> Joey! What a <laughs> ride this episode was. Like, I started watching it, and I love the opening and ending scenes. But, like, three seconds in, it was so awkward. I'm like, pause, go take a lap. Had to come back, sit down, watch that awkwardness play out with Lauren and the cake. Oh, gosh. And then, you know, I guess we, we rewind and go to first dates. Yes. Okay. I will admit when the first group date was a wedding day, I was already mad. I was like, really? So <sighs> I'm mad. I'm so over the wedding date theme. But then it wasn't a photo shoot and it actually was like a weird little reception date where they had to play stupid games like musical chairs and they were trying to get their first dance with joey and even though i still don't love the wedding theme of a date i had a fun time watching it yeah i think this is what the bachelor needs to do more of is they had wedding guests there and everybody all of the women and joey were interacting with the guests too so it was a good opportunity to see how 
somebody would interact in a social situation. Yeah, with other people. Which is far more real than like these dumb photo shoots or these ridiculous like helicopter dates where it's like you're not going to do any of this when you're actually right. together. Uh, Evelyn? Evelyn. I spit my chicken nuggets out. <laughs> like that took me by so much surprise. I was like Damn, girl, she flew across that table. She fucking committed. That was wow. Wow. Joey's face and then him picking up the broken plate. <laughs> yeah, good thing she had a wedding dress on that has like 50 million layers of tools so that she didn't like slice herself up by diving onto the table. Jesse and Joey were both so impressed with her athleticism in that moment. Yeah, I kind of loved that Joey was really into that. I'm like, yeah. I think he was bummed that he couldn't give her the seat because of her effort, but he's like, I'm sorry. She was already in the chair. chair. Yeah, you landed on Lauren. <laughs> unfortunately, like if we're just going by the rules of the game. Oh, it was really entertaining. Yeah. Um, I kind of felt like Lauren and Maria were good examples of why this date isn't always a good idea. Yeah. Um, Maria, though, I have to pause them passing the the camera around. I thought Maria was going to take that moment to be kind of funny about what she wanted at her wedding. And then she's like, I want my mom there and I want my closest friends and I want and I'm like, uh, duh. <laughs> What what this is okay. not good content. Like I was like, this is stupid. But then she's like, Can I, this makes me miss my dad. And then cue Lauren coming in and being like, I felt that and turns out she lost her dad seven months ago. And for her to be in that wedding dress and kind of be confronted with the lack of him in her future. I was like, damn, that's really heartbreaking. That's hard. So Yeah, and Maria did a good job of empathizing with what she was experiencing yeah. and telling her like it's okay that you feel this way like of course that's understandable like take the time you need yeah don't think twice about how you're you know coming off in this moment like you're going through it and she's not wrong it's wild like in some ways you're like seven months that's so long and then when you've got like a heavy loss like that you realize seven months is no time at all it's just she's Lauren's still processing this so like ooh, that was hard and heavy but it's okay. Lauren continued to give, though. She did. She 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 really, she made this episode. So we leave the wedding part of the date to do the dress-up after party. Yeah. Oh, well, we, ha we have to talk about Michael Bolton. Oh, yeah, Rachel. Sorry. My bad. Rachel won the first dance. Yes. And they had motherfucking Michael Bolton, you guys. You guys. It wasn't a no-name country star. And he's saying, when a man loves a woman. When a man. Woman. So good. I like Michael Ball, and that was awesome. Uh, yeah. I was like, my was, lighter, I'm here for this. That this was is a epic. Good, yeah, amazing. I bet some of those girls are too young to even know who Michael Bolton is. Oh my God, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Rachel, oh, sorry, I totally dissed Rachel and her cute speech. She gave a little toast, and I thought off the cuff it was so smart and witty. It was like the perfect balance of like shade, but charming. Yeah, because she was acknowledging like, all the ex-girlfriends being at the wedding. So yeah. she wasn't like dismissing them being there, but also it was kind of like tongue in cheek. Ha -ha. I loved it. Yeah, that was phenomenal. She definitely. I'm uh, glad he picked her for that. And during the dance, they shared some really intimate kisses. It was very romantic. It was very romantic. I think Rachel's going to go far, which is great for Rachel, but bad for me because she's on your team. No, I'm sorry. Damn it. Anyways. Okay, so then we go to the after part of the date where the girls dress up in their normal clothes and they're ready to have their one on one time with Joey. Oh my God. We do you want to tell it, it or do you want it all? <laughs> Whoa, you guys. Okay, feel free, man, if you want to jump in. I'm just going to take the lead here. Maria's in this like corset white dress. It's smoking. She's smoking. Makes her boobs look great. Ooh. And Joey pulls her. She sits down. They're talking and she's like, you know what? I can't breathe in this dress. I'm just, I'm going to go slip into something more comfortable. And she disappears. And it's awkward because Joey's like looking at his watch. Yeah. you. Ha I'm like, how are no other women not coming to interrupt right now? Yeah. Did she like pay producers to just stand by the door and not let anybody in? Because like this isn't how this works normally. There's not like infinite amount of time for yeah. this. My God, she opens the door and she is wearing this tiny little black bolero. A little black bra, bra, and then a form fitted, like lacy black skirt. skirt. Joey is grinning from ear to 
ear. He's also like giving her the up down. He he's blushing. I'm blushing. Like I'm like, oh my god, it's, what is happening? Here? Joey <laughs> is so into it. He is infatuated Maria with Maria. <laughs> is the confidence of this woman, you guys. And she sits down, and he is still giving her the up down, and like, and she's like, wait, what were we talking about? And he's like, uh, I I can't even think about that right now. I don't whoo, that episode that was so hot. It was very hot. The chemistry between them off the charts. And then for her to just like saunter back out there. Oh man, the and she women sits down and nobody is saying anything. And Lauren's still kind of in a bad mood. And her just sitting back, legs crossed, arms crossed, and she's like, Yeah, but why'd you change? <laughs> Epic. Oh. I mean, Maria and Lauren just are giving it to us, and I, I can't with that. That that was, it was great television. I loved Rachel's response. Yeah, like Maria's doing things I wouldn't do, <laughs> but everybody's their own person. So, <laughs> and like I relate to that so hard. I'm like, I would never. But also, such a good idea and clearly effective. Yeah, nobody's done that on The Bachelor. I don't think Maria is really. I'm interested to see where the show takes her because she is so confident and she seems very authentically herself and it is making a lot of women really uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, I hate that because I feel like women should be able to be confident and that not be an affront to every other woman in the room just oh, yeah. by default. Like Maria gets to be confident like that and nobody should feel threatened by that and I know that they are and I think that that's just a testament to how women are sort of felt like they need to be a certain way they're always competing with each other or they need to not be confident you know they need to be meek the however you want to play it and Maria is just like throwing that all out the window or that's one woman's security amplifies another woman's insecurity yes yes and Maria is showing man she's I don't know she's kind of here for the women she's doing a good job she showed up for Lauren I feel like the whole drama with Medina was a little bit blown out of proportion by Sydney. Yes. I hated that. And I feel like Maria really did have Medina's back and was just probably a little bit drunk and speaking too loudly. <laughs> well, she wasn't necessarily shit talking. She, she was wasn't. saying something like she's 31. She goes, that's not even that old. Like Joey should be into that. That's what she was, was saying. That, yeah. She was really saying like, I hate that she feels that because I'm 29 and I'm not feeling that. And like, I do understand, like, the thing that frustrated me about that was Sydney going and being a tattletale and blowing it up when it didn't need to be blown up. Because while I do understand that maybe in her snap reaction, Medina felt like she was minimizing her emotions. Yeah. Which is like, okay. For but, sure. But Medina and Maria can talk about that. We don't need Sydney to insert herself and start causing drama that didn't need to be there. No, not at all. That was such a... And, you know, I think about that as a friend of, like, if you were to overhear that, do you really need to go ruin your friend's night by sharing something that isn't even worth sharing? Like, what was the point of that? You really did just kind of hurt Medina's feelings, and now she's got to deal with this. My theory is that it wasn't really about Medina at all. It was about Sydney wanting more airtime and to be relevant on the show. I totally agree with that. Like... Sydney has zero connection with Joey and is just like, like her, God, I got to make myself relevant. Her days are numbered. Yeah. So, yeah, I felt that way. I was like, what a twerp. Don't do that. <laughs> um, But Maria, man. Whew. Oh, and we have to. um, Sorry. Back to the group date. We kind of <laughs> we lost track. Uh, So some of the women are really starting to put all of their life experience on the table for Joey and really share some of their emotions. There was a lot of crying this episode <laughs> and Joey. Wow. I think he knows how to be very present, make a woman feel comforted. He makes a lot of eye contact. He does a good job of letting them have the time that they need. I'm very impressed with how he's handled all of the uh, trauma dumping. I know. And I, Huh. I wish it wasn't really a part of the show as much as it is. Right, because but like he does, he navigates it well. Yeah, I mean, just by nature of the show, how it, like it's unfortunate that you're not able to find opportune times to really talk about things. Um, 
Yeah, he did handle that so well. So like on the group date, Jess talks about being cheated on and the infidelity there and like rebuilding herself and feeling like the women don't want her to be herself. I will admit I was a little confused about how all of it related to what was happening. Same. I do. I was like, so are you saying that because you are obnoxious, other people had issues with that? And and they're like, no, she's just trying to tie it all together. It's like it's obviously such a a pressure cooker kind of situation that I think like any sort of negativity or way probably does bring up like all sorts of other feelings for you because it's just going to play on your biggest insecurities. You're like on TV. Yeah. You're all competing for the same guy. Like I, I see it, but yeah, it is. It, was, it felt like a little bit of a reach to me, but I understand why maybe she's just like in her feels because it's a hard situation. Yeah. But Jesse gives her the rose, which I called. I was like, he's going to give Jess the rose. And he did. I personally am not a huge Jess fan. Um, no. I didn't love how she, we didn't even talk about this last week, but I kind of hated how he kissed her first. And then she like, Went Don't in kiss and, and tell. It. Yeah. And not even like one on one, like, oh my God, he kissed me. She like goes into the room. Well, I got a schmoochy poo. Right. <laughs> like, what? You are being so territorial right now. It's one of the few times that don't ask, don't tell. Like, and I will say that my, like, my friend Julia had a completely different read on Jess. She's like, oh yeah, I like Jess. Da, 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 da. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, maybe. Maybe other people like her and I, it's, she's not as polarizing as I initially thought she would be. Yeah, I, I don't have a good feel on just I did. It came down a little bit this episode. I think anytime somebody humanizes themselves and talks about these things, it's like, oh, right. You're a person with experiences, and feelings. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Obviously, like. But yeah, I I'm I'm not a huge Jess fan. Little bummed that she got that rose. But what are you going to do? Yeah. Um. Daisy gets a one-on-one. Yeah, and she's looking forward to it so that she can talk to Joey about her cochlear implant. Cochlear implant. Yeah, that's a big one. I was nervous for her when they went to the music festival. Yeah, and in a helicopter. It's like, did you pick the fucking loudest date on purpose? I know. I know. Isn't well? I yeah. I'll I'll maybe I want to talk to you about something off off the podcast before we get to it. But yeah, the helicopter. I'm just like, this is not a good date for this. I'm glad she could hear him. I'm glad that it wasn't too hard. Um, I thought it was interesting that she made the point that like she can't actually differentiate people's voices. Yeah, like I need to see your mouth. Yeah, so like the closeness of all of that. And she said that Joey was great, which tells you like he is present in those moments. Like he is, he's giving the attention that, every one of these contestants deserves. And so I thought that was really cool. And he handled the information well about her cochlear implant. And I think a music festival would be a fun date. So fun. Again, Um, that's another really good date, right? Like letting these, these guys just go out and experience what you might do day to day. I think that that was really fun. Uh, And then she talks about how sick she was with Lyme disease and how she started losing her hearing. Like everything she went through was like, wow, that's heroin. That's a lot. Uh, and I felt like he, I love how he followed up about her nonprofit so that she had more time to talk about her experience. Um, I will admit, I just, as much as I am impressed with Daisy and her resilience, I don't think they had a lot of chemistry. They didn't. I agree. They seem like, yeah, that seemed like a fine date. Yeah, it wasn't bad, but I was just like, it's not Maria okay, level. What's next? <laughs> yeah, she's. It's not that Daisy's boring, but she just, she's, she seems like a very normal person. Yeah. That would be my energy level on all of this. Like, it's so hard to be good television unless you're willing to, like, really, I think, go to more extremes. And she's just not that person. And that's fine for her. Not the best television. Well, maybe now that she's gotten her story out and she's more comfortable, maybe she'll let loose a little bit more. Yeah. But I think she was probably, like, really anxious and needing to get past this major hurdle. So I guess we'll see what happens. I just wasn't sold on them as a couple. I agree with that. And then, oh, the second group date. (laughs) Yeah. So I did not understand the rules of this game either because I have a lot of thoughts on this. Me too. Okay, go. Okay, so we meet Jubilee and Demi, which are old school Bachelor Nation people. I'm actually really happy to see Demi 
on here. She's really struggled with her mental health. She's recently come out as autistic. She's been having a really hard time. And I'm glad that she was invited back to the yeah, show to do awesome. this. I like that made me really happy to see her. And she was funny. Yeah, I thought they both did great. Jubilee is from originally from Ben Higgins season. She was also on Bachelor in Paradise. And then Demi was originally on Clayton. No, not Clayton. The other one. Colton. Colton. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Clayton and Colton are like interchangeable in my head and yet um, so different but also so different. that is a mistake that everybody yep. yeah sorry the names <laughs> no. the builds i don't know uh and then she was also on bachelor in paradise twice i think and she came out as bisexual yeah and now i didn't know that she came out wow yeah so she's she's kind of had a go of it i think and so it's it's cool to see her it's also cool that bachelor nation is giving is making room for someone like demi when it's such a frustratingly traditional platform sometimes and they'll go out of their way to avoid a mess yeah if they feel like it's not in their best interest and i do feel like they're taking a little bit of a gamble with demi so hey we'll yeah. take it so it starts out with like this boot camp thing and it's women are doing crossfit light <laughs> yeah they're doing push-ups which Ugh. i mean a lot of scary push-ups joey's push-ups Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Joe, I know. I was like, who's that pushing up? I'm like, oh, it's Joey. That makes sense. Joey's push ups. <laughs> and not because he's a guy. Like, there is a form issue there. And I think if everybody learns how to do a push up properly, all of the women on this date would have done better push ups yeah, too. Of they, they've got the strength for it. It's just, for they, some reason, maybe everybody they just learns haven't them been wrong. coached to do a push up. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they just don't do push ups, which is okay too. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they're doing things like jumping jacks and flipping tires. And Joey's helping the women who can't quite flip the tire by themselves. And then they start playing this game, which is basically capture the flag, except they're capturing Joey's heart. And there is paint. Yeah, I didn't really understand the paint. I'm like, one, just plow through everybody. Yes. They, they said there are no rules. So there's two teams of five. And all they have to do is go get the other team's heart and run it back to their side. My question is. I thought if you got hit with paint, you're out. But the paint no seemed com – that's right. Then I was like, why are women not tackling and, like, exactly. grabbing? Exactly. Like, why are women just running with no repercussions? Get physical. Or, like, having the way that you would do with, like, flag football, having, like, something around your waist where, like, if you if you lose that, yeah. you've been caught. Yeah, like, stop. It's not saying – full body contact can be kind of iffy, but, like, you bet know, your but ass – there's no rules. I know. I would be tackling people. I do tackle people. Softball, tackle. You know, so, like – bizarre to me it looked fun but i would have played also, more aggressive why were the women not doing a better job at protecting the hearts right strategy <laughs> two Who's people the guarding fastest the hearts? runner and is going to sprint back and then two people yeah exactly <laughs> like at least two people guarding the heart three people offense and defense yeah come on guys i don't even watch sports when i know this <laughs> just was like no rules anything could happen and i just felt like it was very lackluster very lackluster <laughs> Edwina can go though. Yeah. That girl has speed. That was amazing. And she also fell in a hilarious amount of times. Yeah. Um, Which I appreciate the effort there. That yes. was that was awesome. So the winning team thinks they're getting more time with Joey, and then they find out only one person gets more time with Joey. Dude, and I thought that was fucked up. What a dick move of the show to be like, so you all have to go home and get ready, but only one yeah. of you is actually going. I was like, well, tell us who it is now, because I don't want to get ready. Yeah, I know. That I thought was such bullshit. I'm like, this is cruel. It is cruel. I have like one tired. in five chance. Like, how much energy am I putting into is my it? outfit? Yeah. I. Also... These girls only brought so many outfits. And if you have like a chance of having one on one time with Joey, it's like, which it's a gamble, right? Which outfit do I use to be waiting to know if I get the one on one time? Yeah. It's like wasting an outfit. I know. I'm trying to be better about this and just remembering that it's important to recycle outfits because it's better but, for the but environment. Women don't do that on the show. I know. We need to normalize that though. I know. Re wear but I'm saying, good outfits. In their circumstance, in their minds, it's like, which outfit do I waste? Mm hmm. For sure, for sure. Yeah, that that was a bummer. I didn't like that. I thought that was dirty. We got some good wins in this episode, and there's still elements of, like, this is dirty. That was one of them. Yeah, I didn't like that. So then he picks Edwina. Her background, being from Liberia, and yeah. her closeness and connectedness with her family was incredible. I loved hearing about that. That was Give us more interesting contestants. Yeah. I don't need another white Christian Southern person. 
you know, they're fine, whatever. But like, it makes for so much more engaging television when you have truly different walks of life, interesting people. Yeah. And like, her, the, I, the mix. Yeah. And I just could not get over listening to her talk about family. Like, I just and thought that the was the oldest sister a, in an African family and how that impacts her um, and her responsibility. Yeah. Like, I loved it. I was like, give me more Edwina right now. I I love this. So that I thought was awesome. I thought Joey made a good pick there. I mean, she fucking deserved it for how hard she went. Yeah. But then also like awesome. Interesting people. I also like how Joey isn't just giving it to the person he's most interested in. I like how he's like, you tried the hardest. You win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Because other times it's been pretty obvious that no matter the effort level, they just pick who they want to talk to, which I understand both sides. But I think as an athlete, Joey, like, really respects and appreciates the the level of effort that is being shown. Yeah, her athleticism <laughs> was no joke. Yeah. Not saying he's not interested in Edwina, but we um, – was it Kylie? One of the Kylies that he's interested in was there. And so I was wondering if he would pick her – or you mean Kelsey's sorry Kelsey yes yeah 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 yeah. I had that thought too I was like he's really into Kelsey but she's like and she did she did get one heart but yeah and I think right it's always a mixed bag we talked about this off the podcast but like going in these guys or you know the bachelorette sort of know who their top people are yeah and so it's, it's like are they just gonna kind of lean towards those people in those moments uh and I was I, really happy he picked Edwina yeah because otherwise we haven't gotten a lot of her and they seem to have a good connection. So like, let's see where that goes. Yeah. I love it. Um, then we else? just have the cocktail party. Oh yeah. The cocktail party. Uh, Maria dropping the mic with her conversation with Sydney. You're starting to get the feeling that the house is going to turn against Maria. Are you starting to feel yeah. that already? She's, she's getting the villain at it. And it's interesting because she's not an obvious villain. I think it's just that she's really confident and not really willing to play into the bullshit. She's also quite a bit older. Yeah. I mean, Medina is 31. She's 29. But I think those two are the old. I hate, like, cringe every time the word old like, comes out of my mouth. Like, 31. <laughs> um, No. Get that out means, of here. That means we're ancient. God, I know. It's fine. I don't feel ancient, actually. And I'm really happy to be in my, you know, mid to late 30s at this point. It's way better than my 20s. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, Yeah, I Maria is definitely getting a villain edit, but I'm here for it. This is the kind of villain I want. Like, we don't need to be making fun of people's ADHD. We don't need to be no. being like actually fucking shitty. I think Maria's level of confidence and just sort of like, I'm not doing this is awesome. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Here for this. Honestly, Lauren too. Um, but she gone. She's gone. I get it. I think that was the right call for her. And I, I know I'm getting ahead, but I loved the ending where they showed the whole scene and it just was like a reminder of how editable reality tv can be oh yeah and then the first scene you're like oh my god this is fucking awful and then by the time you see it at the end joey's like in on it everything's fine her throwing the cake is just camp like yeah it's good i wasn't a lauren fan i'm fine that she's gone but she was good television she was so good television that's the hard thing is like some of the some of the um i found her a little obnoxious yeah for um, sure. <laughs> but also when the show gets rid of all of the obnoxious or controversial people, there's not a lot of interesting television. So well, I also appreciate the value they add. I think because then we get into like what after our episode five or six shit starts Ugh. getting real and you're just like, yeah, I really like the bachelor from like episode two until maybe like two episodes before hometowns. And then it gets a little formulaic. Yeah, because you, you do lose the people who are interesting and you're just down to who Joey is into, which is fine. But like suddenly the stakes are high. You do kind of care about everybody a little more because you know everybody. There were still women this, this that went home that I was like, wait a minute, who was that? And I like had to look it up and be like, oh, Marlena, off my radar. I, okay, bye. <laughs> yep. But I will just say. I feel like the energy on this season is so different. I feel like these women legitimately are into Joey. They wow. want to date Joey. What a difference. When the first date card came, so I'm still relatively new to the Bachelor verse. I've only seen Clayton season, Zach season, Matt James season. 
to this season, like watching how they all lit up and were so fucking giddy and just like, ah! I'm like, very wow, different. they're into this. They're excited. That's so cool. I'm excited for them. Like, and that's fun. He's got swagger. He's, he is emotionally intelligent. His eyes are on fire. Um, I'm attracted to Joey. I just, I'm excited about this season. Yeah. So. The, I think the women being so into it too is a big change. And, I appreciate that at least so far the show has tried to make a few edits to how they do things. Yeah. I think that then you were starting to actually feel the shift in um, producers. Yeah. It doesn't feel exactly the same. Everything is different enough. I'm like, okay. All they're right. also adding in new music and sound effects. Uh, I'm so glad they're switching up the dates, even if the themes are similar. You know, like, please, please keep making it different. Please do new things. Get creative. Yeah, there's no reason not to. And they've got such a good cast. Joey's a great bachelor. Let's hope we keep liking him. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it's pretty predictable that about halfway through the season, we'll probably start to dislike Joey because that's what happens on The Bachelor. But I guess we'll see what happens. Has that ever not happened? I was trying to remember, and I don't think so. Yeah. But I feel like I consistently always like The Bachelorettes. And then like halfway through a Bachelor season, it's like, wah, wah. That's too bad. I don't know. Hmm. Well, it's on our radar. We'll see how it goes. But I'm I'm feeling really hopeful. Me too. This is so fun. I like I truly had so much fun watching this episode. I like spit my chicken nuggets out, cheering for Michael Bolton. <laughs> like the drama the with Maria. Maria. I loved Lauren. <laughs> that her sitting there with her legs folded, asking Maria why she changed. Why so, she changed? So deadpan. Will live rent free in my head probably forever. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I'm ready for this season, guys. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to touch on? Um, no, but Jess and I are doing a little push to get more listeners yeah. slash engagement. Um, so if you would take the time to rate and or review our podcast, it would really help us um, gain a little bit more traction with gaining more listeners or getting up higher up in the algorithms. Yeah, we want to be able to keep doing this for everybody. And if we could just break even on costs to produce, that would be so rad because we're having a lot of fun doing it and we want to keep putting out a good podcast for you guys. So, yeah, it is a passion project, but any like little um, boosts you guys can give us would be so appreciated. Uh, so appreciated. Yeah. And it's truly just word of mouth. Tell your friends that we're kind of cool. And, you know, if you have time, review us and sub subscribe. Yeah, please. And subscribe on all the platforms you listen on. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Bye. Drama Bonded is produced and hosted by Jessica Brumbaugh and Mandy Booth. Our production manager and editor is Solomon Brumbaugh. Our theme music is by Joe Waters. You can find more of his music streaming on the EP Jupiter Daywatch. Music vocals by Mandy Booth. Graphic designer is Pigeon House. Special thanks to everybody who has downloaded and listened to us we are so, so grateful for your support. Thank you. Welcome to our podcast. Is that not how it goes? No, it is. Oh. But usually you say, I'm Jess, and then I say, I'm oh, Mandy. That's right. <laughs> I'm, do we? Yeah. You say, welcome to our podcast. I'm Jess, and oh, I say, I'm Mandy. Okay. And today we're talking about Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. I had like the biggest brain fart there. I'm like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> this is a good start. <laughs> Whew, can't even get through the intro. Okay. Three, two, one.